Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty 7. For some reason Coach Shimamoto was reluctant to end practice. Usually these postseason workouts were light affairs, mostly intra-squad scrimmages followed by a dunking contest. This one he kept prolonging with wind sprints and full-court defensive drills. He finally blew his whistle and motioned for the team to gather around him. Exhausted, we flopped to the floor, sucking wind and hoping Coach Shimamoto would take pity on our fatigued bodies. What does concatenate mean? Tell me, and you can go. Harriet Montoya, the only person with strength enough to speak, raised her hand. I didn't have much faith she'd know the answer, the day before she had defined repeal as putting the skin back on an orange and peeling again, and we had had to run 30 laps backward. Concatenate means together. Not like all in the same boat together, but like connected, like a bicycle chain. Close enough. Remember that definition, you soon to be revolutionaries. With that, coach dismissed us into a cool late April afternoon. On the way home I was wondering what coach meant by soon-to-be revolutionaries when I noticed a distant column of black smoke billowing into the dusk like a tornado too tired to move. What's that? I asked Scobie. Eric Dolphy, he replied, referring to the stop-and-go shrieking that was escaping from his boom box. No, I mean that, I said, pointing to the noxious-looking cloud. Scobie didn't know but he was more than willing to make up for his ignorance in smoke formations by lecturing me on the relevance of Dolphy's sonic turmoil to teenage negromites like ourselves. Midway through the seminar in music appreciation another silo of smoke twisted into the dusk, this one closer to us. The driver of a rundown Nova sped down Sawyer Drive, leaning on her high-pitched horn for no apparent reason. Scobie turned up the volume on the tape deck just a bit. Another car flew through a stop sign, then reversed its direction. When the car drew parallel to us, the driver flashed a gap-toothed smile, then shot a raised fist out the window and raced away. Soon every driver that passed was joyriding through the streets, honking the horn and violating the traffic laws like a Hollywood stunt driver in the big chase scene. The driver of a Wonder Bread delivery truck pulled a B-movie U-turn, hopped on the sidewalk, then peeled out down an alley. Dolphy's horn matched the curbside cacophony flutter for flutter, screech for screech. How does the music make you feel, man? I feel like I'm dry heaving while free-falling from 15,000 feet. That's it, man, you getting it. Feel, gooner, feel. Let the jazz seep into your pores. People began spilling from their homes. They paced up and down the sidewalks, looking tense and unaware they'd left their front doors wide open. Something was wrong, no Angelino ever leaves the door open. I caught the eye of a middle-aged man wearing white patent leather shoes, ochre-colored polyester pants, and a Panama hat and standing on his front porch looking desperate for someone to talk to. What's happening? I asked. Them cracker motherfuckers did it again. The Rodney King verdict, I'd completely forgotten. They let them racists go. I'm surprised the judge didn't reprimand the Peckerwood so-called peace officers for not finishing the job. Let go? What did that mean? The officers had to be found guilty of something, obstruction of traffic, at least. I doubted the man in the patent leather shoes version. I could hear the TV in his living room, and I peeped through his doorway. The smirk on the reporter's face told me the man was right, even before I heard her say, not guilty on all charges. I never felt so worthless in my life. Uninvited, Scobie and I walked into the man's living room, set our book bags on his coffee table, and sat on the couch. I looked out the window and saw a store owner spray paint black owned across her boarded up beauty salon. I wanted to dig out my heart and have her do the same to it, certifying my identity in big block letters across both ventricles. 
I suddenly understood why my father wore his badge so proudly. The badge protected him, in uniform he was safe. Sitting on that couch watching the announcer gloat, my pacifist negro chrysalis peeled away, and a glistening anger began to test its wings. A rage that couldn't be dealt with in a poem or soothed with the glass of milk and glazed donut offered by our kind host. There's a poem in there somewhere, the man said. He and Scobie must have been talking about me. I wanted to slap Scobie, he sat there giggling, egging the man on with a fling of his hand. What do you write about, the man asked. I write about whatever. I envied Psycho Loco. Strangers never asked him, what kind of people do you kill? Could you do a little killing right now, just for me? Psycho Loco dealt with his rage by blaming and lashing out, there was no pretense of fairness and justice, due process was whatever mood he was in, clemency was his running out of bullets while shooting at you. Have you ever published anything? Yeah, back in Hillside he writes his poems on the wall. I've been published in a few magazines too. There's a company in New York that wants to publish a book of my shit. Even at its most reflective or its angriest, my poetry was little more than an opiate devoted to pacifying my cynicism. Poetry was a 16-year-old's valium, write a football of haikus and stay away from fatty foods. I now know that Psycho Loco's violence was no less a psychological placebo than my poetry, but watching the acquitted officers shake hands with their attorneys and stroll triumphantly into the April sun, I saw his brutality as a powerful vitriolic stimulant. I wanted to sip this effervescent bromo that cleared one's head and numbed the aches and pains of oppression. Psycho Loco had the satisfaction of standing up to his enemies and listening to them scream, watching them close their eyes for the last time. Psycho Loco had a semblance of closure and accomplishment. He was threat. The American poet was a tattletale, a winner, at best an instigator. You write about blowing up the White House and they tap your phone, but only when you buy some dynamite will they tap you on the shoulder and say, come with me. Nigger, you ain't never said nothing about no book. Nigger, you ain't never asked. I wanted to taste immediate vindication, experience the rush of spitting in somebody's, anybody's, face. The day of the LA riots I learned that it meant nothing to be a poet. One had to be a poet and a farmer, a poet and a roustabout, a poet and a soon-to-be revolutionary. I looked at Scobie and said, let's break. We gathered our things, thanked the man for his kindness, and prepared to leave. We spent an awkward moment in silence till the man asked, is that Dolphy? Scobie nodded, and we made our way toward the commotion, listening to Dolphy play his horn like he was ringing a wash rag. I couldn't decide whether the music sounded like a death knell or the cavalry charge for a ragtag army. We turned the corner onto Hoover and Alvarado and walked into Carnival, poor people's style. The niggers and spicks had decided to secede from the Union, armed with rifles, slingshots, bottles, camcorders, and songs of freedom. Problem was, nobody knew where Fort Sumter was. In the middle of the intersection, the Wonder Bread truck we'd seen before was careening in circles, trying to find a path through the labyrinth of flaming dumpsters and rioters. Another stranded teamster in a beer truck crashed into a barrier and broadsided the Wonder Bread man, sending both vehicles sprawling on their sides. The Wonder Bread truck slid to a stop ten feet in front of Scobie and me like a huge shuffleboard disc, its engine sputtering and wheels spinning. The driver scrambled out of the cab. Before he could bolt into the street, I slammed him against the side of the truck. Bug-eyed with fear, he babbled something about having never done nothing to nobody. I'd never seen anyone afraid of me. I wondered what my face looked like. Were my nostrils flaring, my eyes pulsing red? I was about to shout, Booga Booga, and give the guy a heart attack when Scobie clambered from the rear of the truck, chewing on a cupcake and holding loaves of bread. Our captive dropped to his knees, begging for mercy. He took out his wallet and showed us pictures of his kids, as if they were for sale. I took a dowie satchel and swung it at his face, 
striking him solidly in the cheek. I know it didn't hurt, but the man whimpered in shame and resigned himself to the beating. Nicholas and I pummeled him silly with pillows of white bread until it snowed breadcrumbs. Hillside was surprisingly quiet. There were no roving bands of looters, no brush fires. Hillside seemed to be biding its time till morning. Manny Montoya and his wife Sally opened the barbershop and chiropractic offices and turned it into a way station for weary rioters coming back from the festivities on the other side of the wall. Handing out free tamales and steaming bowls of ponchi soup, Sally proudly told stories about how hillsiders had historically acquitted themselves well in Los Angeles's riots. Beating back an armada of drunken sailors in the Zoot, Suit riots in the summer of 43, blowing up four police cars and poisoning six police dogs with cyanide-laced chitlins and chorizo in the Watts riots of 65, torturing and killing an entire squad of National Guardsmen from Pacoima in the infamous Hillside Death March during the I'm Tired of the White Man Fucking With Us and Whatnot riots of 68. Manny smiled at his wife's recounting and predicted that La Insurrection de 92 would be the biggest of them all. The tamales made me thirsty and I headed over to Ms. Kim's store to buy something to drink. When I got there, she was yelling in Korean and pressing Molotov cocktails into the hands of a small group of bystanders, pleading with them to burn down her store. Loot, goddammit. You saw video. Remember Latasha Harlan's. Burn my fucking store down. I feel better. Rodney King. Rodney King. Rodney King. The crowd refused. Ms. Kim was too well liked. Maybe if she had been 100% Korean they'd have busted a few windows just for appearance's sake. Holding one of her makeshift grenades, Ms. Kim lit the oil rag fuse and strode to the front of the store. The crowd surged to stop her, and she held them at bay by waving the torch in their stunned faces. Then she wheeled and sent the bomb hurling through the glass doors. The flames slowly crawled across the floor whipping through the aisles, then scaling the counter. Ms. Kim silently hookshot another cocktail onto the roof and watched her store burn with a satisfied smile. A few folks tried to douse the flames with garden hoses, but Ms. Kim cut their hoses in half with a Swiss army knife, then went looking for the police to place herself under arrest. The next afternoon Scobie and I sat in his basement watching the rest of the city burn on television. A parade of relatives marched through his house hawking their wares. Look what I came up on. Holding up sweaters and jackets that smelled like smoke for our perusal. Gooner, you'd look good in this. Got a lame collar. Bill Cosby would wear this Jamie. You nix man, two dollars. Nigger, move, you in front of the TV. It was hard not to be envious of somebody who had some free shit and a little crumb of the California dream. I too wanted to come up, but I didn't think I was a thief. The television stations were airing live feeds from hot spots around the city, showing looters entering stores empty handed and exiting carrying furniture on their backs like worker ants carrying ten times their weight. Hey, isn't that the Montgomery Ward Plaza? The mall was about ten minutes away just outside the wall. Yeah, there go technology town. Oh shit, fools coming up on free computers and shit. Scobie and I looked each other in the eye for about a nanosecond, then stormed out of the house. Running down the streets, we argued over the merits of an IBM compatible versus an Apple. Dude, I'm looking for a wizard protean. What? You can't carry out a desktop. Go for a laptop. You get all the qualities of a protean, plus mobility. Your dumb ass is trying to steal a whole mainframe. Coach Shimamoto's arduous workouts had served their purpose. We reached Technology Town fresh and ready to celebrate Christmas in April. Leaping through the broken windows, we tumbled over a stack of plastic shopping baskets and landed in a snowbank of styrofoam package filler. We were too late. All the presents had been opened. The showroom was stripped bare. Broken shelving dangled from the walls, 
overturned showcases spilled over onto the floor, serving as caskets for dead batteries and the shells of broken stereo equipment. Unraveled cassette tape hung from the overhead pipes like brown riot tinsel. Even the ceiling fans and service phones were gone. What happens to a dream deferred? I said in my best classical recitation voice. Scoby cursed and threw a 9-volt battery at my head. Fuck Langston Hughes. I bet when they rioted in Harlem, Langston got his. Does it dry up like a wino in rehab? Or gesture like a whore, reeling from the pimp's left jab? Kicking our way through the piles of cardboard, we left the store and stood in the parking lot thinking of our next target. People were still ransacking cribs, and bibs, the toddler shop, but rattles, powdered milk, and designer diapers didn't interest us. Scobie snapped his fingers, shouted, what did you say, and sprinted toward the alley that ran behind the mall. What did you say? Was a car accessory emporium that specialized in deafeningly loud car stereos and equally loud seat covers. I couldn't figure out how Scobie planned to get in the place. What did you say? Was known to be impenetrable. A solid metal garage door that had foiled the attempts of a who's who of burglary specialists sealed the front entrance. The famed barrier had withstood ramming from hijacked semi trucks, dynamite, and every solvent from hot sauce for Lucy's burritos to 150 proof rum mixed with corrosive black hair products. When we got to what did you say, the steel door was still in place. Scobie and I put our ears against the door and heard what sounded like mice scurrying around inside. We zipped around the back and found a small opening smashed into the cinderblock wall, a guilty-looking sledgehammer lying atop a pile of rubble. Every ten seconds or so a contortionist would squeeze through the hole, bearing some sort of electronic gadgetry. Standing nearby in tears was fat Reese Clinksdale. Reese was bemoaning his girth, because he was too big to fit in the hole and was missing out on the rebellion. He wiped his eyes and stopped blubbering for a bit. You guys going in? I guess so, we answered. Well, you better hurry up. I think most of the good stuff is gone. Reese was right. The crawlspace was starting to give birth to zoo animals. Guys were popping headfirst through the hole wrapped in sheepskin and leopardskin seat covers and looking like cuddly animals at the petting zoo. I helped deliver a breech baby alligator seat cover who decided to exit feet first and had to be pulled through the cement birth canal. When the traffic was light enough to make an entrance, Scobie and I slid through the hole. The absolute lack of chaos was amazing. Instead of a horde of one-eyed brigands pillaging and setting fires, the looters were very courteous and the plundering was orderly. Everyone waited patiently in a line that wound through the aisles and into the storeroom. Once you were in the storeroom, a philanthropic soul handed you a box off the shelf. You didn't get your choice of goods, but no one complained. If you wanted something else, you just got in line again. Looting wasn't as exciting as Scobie and I had hoped it would be. Nicholas came up on a car alarm and I on a box of pine tree shaped air fresheners. On the way back to the neighborhood, we saw Pookie Hamilton drive by in his convertible bug. I whistled and Pookie pulled over to the curb, waving for us to get in the back seat. Where you headed, Pook? I just got a page from Psycho Loco. He needs some help. I hadn't forgotten about Psycho Loco's planned big score, but the greedy look in his eyes whenever he talked about the heist told me that I didn't want to be involved. Drop me and Scobie off at my house. No time, gee. Well, where we going? Montgomery Wards. When we pulled into the Montgomery Ward parking lot, there were Psycho Loco, Noam O. Clark, and Joe Shenanigan standing behind Psycho Loco's van next to a huge iron safe. Grimy, covered with sweat, the boys were overjoyed to see us. So this was, the heist. What the fuck? Are you motherfuckers crazy? Chill, Holmes. We just want help lifting this thing into the van. How did you get it out? Look, Scobie said, 
pointing to a set of rubber wheels attached to the bottom of the strongbox. Only Montgomery Ward would build a mobile safe. I had two thoughts. Why are all safes painted beige, and would my mother come visit me in prison? Dude, I can't be wearing no stonewashed prison outfit for the rest of my life. That shit makes me itch. Scobie tried to comfort me. You can wear any kind of shirt you want, just no rhinestones or metal buttons. Besides, I haven't seen one police car the whole day. He was right. I hadn't even noticed. The entire day had been an undeclared national holiday. Los Angeles was a theme park and we were spending the day in anarchy land. All stores and banks remain open, but unstaffed. From this point, waiting time for this attraction is zero minutes. I calmed down. The safe was unbelievably heavy, which everyone but me took as a positive sign. I thought the thing could just as easily be empty or filled with employee time cards as stuffed with valuables. On our third try we almost had the safe inside the back of the van when we all heard an extremely disheartening sound. What's that? Everyone asked. Uh, the Doppler effect, I said. Shit, it's the cops. With a final strain we edged the safe onto the bumper of the van, but our knees buckled under the weight and the safe dropped to the ground with a heavy thud. The sirens were getting closer. No one had the energy for another lift, but we couldn't leave the safe in the middle of the parking lot, not with visions of Spanish gold doubloons dancing in our heads. I looked in the van and saw a length of rope. How stupid we'd been. All we needed to do was tie one end to the safe's handle and the other end to the van's bumper and we could drive away, pulling the safe along behind us. I heard the cop car pull into the parking lot. My back tightened in anticipation of hearing a gunshot or a threatening, get your hands up and step away from the vehicle. What I did hear was something I hadn't heard in years, my father's voice. I told the boys to keep going and I'd distract him. I turned around to see my father step out of the car, gripping a shotgun in one hand. Dad. Long time no see. Things must really be hectic if you're out on the streets. I heard the van slowly pull off, and I looked back to see the safe trailing behind it like a tin can tied to the car of newlyweds headed for their honeymoon. When I turned to face my father, the hard rubber butt of the shotgun crashed into my jaw. I saw a flash of white and dropped to the pavement. My father's partner stepped on my ear, muffling his words. You are not a Kaufman. I refuse to let you embarrass me. You can't embarrass me with poetry and your niggerish ways. And where did you get all these damn air fresheners? Something hard smacked the side of my neck, sending my tongue rolling out of my mouth like a party favor. I could taste the salty ash on the pavement. Ash that had drifted from fires set in anger around the city. I remembered learning in third grade that snakes see and hear with their sensitive tongues. I imagined my tongue almost bitten through, hearing the polarithms of my father's nightstick on my body. Through my tongue I saw my father transform into a master Senegalese drummer beating a surrender code on a hollow log on the banks of the muddy Gambia River. A flash of white, the night of my conception, my father twisting Mama's arm behind her back and ordering her to assume the position. A flash of white, my father potty training me by slapping me across the face and sticking my hand in my mushy excrement. Soon my body stopped bucking with every blow. There was only white, no memories, no visions, only the sound of voices. Gunnar, my young revolutionary, while you were in a coma, you got a letter from the Nike basketball camp. You've been chosen as one of the hundred best ballplayers in the nation. Actually, you're number 100. Coach Shimamoto, son, your father and I both think it's best for you to transfer to another school. We're sending you to El Campesino Real in the Valley. Mom, dude, you got fucked up. Nicholas Scobie. You gots to get better, cuz. We can't figure out how to open the safe. Psycho Loco. 
The safe sat in the middle of Psycho Loco's den, a three-dimensional puzzle daring to be solved. Old Abuela Gloria, reportedly an expert safecracker in Havana during Batista's glory days, was wearing a stethoscope and listening to the tumblers click as she spun the combination dial back and forth. Isn't Abuela Gloria deaf? I asked Ms. Sanchez. Yeah, but she insisted on trying. Abuela Gloria removed the stethoscope from her ears and pulled on the latch. Nothing happened. Fucking goddamn box. Scobie was calculating possible permutations of a combination lock numbered from 0 to 100. He'd already tried 32,000 different combinations while I was in the hospital. Psycho Loco came in from the kitchen and tossed me a cold carta blanca. The beer sailed over my head and I had to stretch my aching arms to catch the tumbling bottle. Damn, you did that on purpose. That shit hurt. Just a little physical therapy to speed up your convalescence. Thanks. When you flying to Portland to the basketball camp? August 6th, end of the summer. I should be healed by then. Scobie knelt beside the safe, flipping the dial from number to number and shaking his cramping hands in frustration as his magic failed him. Gooner, look at the safe. Maybe you can figure out a way to open it. What I know about opening a safe? That thing almost got me killed. I don't give a fuck if you never get it open. I was lying and Psycho Loco knew it. I hadn't taken my eyes off the box since I'd been there. I couldn't shake the word, treasure, from my head, rubies, gold lanterns, and ancient scrolls. I wanted to free the genie and fuck up my three wishes. I wish I knew how a Bill Fanger fan tell the different fay between a one, a five, and a ten dollar bill. I wish I food Dan Fay like Burt Williams. I wish I had a lifetime supply of Super Bowls, so I food bound Fay them as high and as hard as I pleased without worrying about losing them. I ran my hands over the safe's tapered edges, then stood back, waved my fingers, and said in a slow, spooky voice, open sesame. We did that shit already. A la chasm, hocus pocus, we even paid that voodoo lady on Normandy $50 to open it with some of that OL time Yoruba religion. What happened? She got chicken blood and pixie dust all over the fucking place. Damn near burned the house down with all the candles. I turned the safe so the door faced me. The wheels creaked under its weight. I wish we could open this thing right now. I can't take the suspense. Psycho Loco, how did you know where to find the safe? Psycho Loco laughed. His mother groaned. I feel like Ma Barker, she said, and left the room. Gooner, you got to have patience. I've been planning to steal this thing ever since I was ten. You remember how the toy department in Montgomery Wards was like 25 feet from the door? Yeah, that was stupid. Fools used to run through there, grab a G.I. Joe doll or a Hot Wheel car and break. Well, there was this race car set that I wanted, the Tommy Thunder 5000. It came with a racing helmet, the headlights on the cars worked, the whole nine but it was too big and heavy to pick up and walk out with, I had to get it closer to the door. So every day after school I moved the box one inch closer. I did this for the entire fifth grade. Straight genius. Little by little, my Tommy Thunder 5000 was steadily easing toward that front door. Finally I had the box close enough to the door. On the day I was going to take it, I was so happy. I invited every kid I knew over to my house to race them cars. I get to the store and my Tommy Thunder 5000 is gone. In its place is a potted plant. In one day Montgomery Wards turned the toy department into gardening supplies. Where the electric trains used to be were mounds of fertilizer. The video game cartridges were transformed into seed packets. I went berserk and started yelling for the manager. Where's my goddamn Tommy Thunder 5000? Who moved my race car set? I demand to speak to the manager. Security tried to get me to leave, 
but I wouldn't leave. I started pissing on rose bushes, demanding to see the manager. The manager comes down and escorts me to his office on the second floor in the back, near the linens. He asks me why I'm so upset and I explain to him how I'd been slowly stealing the Tommy Thunder 5000 and by moving the toy section near the escalator he fucked up my summer. So to cool me out he says, sorry about the Tommy Thunder 5000, but to make up for your troubles you can have anything you see in my office. I look around. He got lollipops, candy canes, and stuffed animals in there. I see the safe sitting in the corner. I go, I want that, pointing to the safe. He goes, you can't have that, young man. That's valuable property, and hands me a candy cane. I'm like, motherfucker, you said anything. That safe is mine, you watch. And Tata, nine years later, look where the safe sits, in my living room. You are patient, yeesh. Must be that Apache blood. I hope you ain't waiting for the white man to disappear too. I looked closely at the safe. The tag dangling from the handle flapped in the current of a household draft. The tag read, Montgomery Ward Duro Safe. This safe is solid tungsten. Airtight, fireproof, and guaranteed to withstand pressure up to 3,500 pounds per square inch. I knew there had to be a way to open it, this was a Montgomery Ward product. Nothing they made worked. Their television sets came with wire hangers and a pair of pliers to turn the channel after the knobs fell off. I had an idea. I asked Abuela Gloria for her safe-cracking kit. I set the small metal box about three feet behind the safe, asked Scoby, Ms. Sanchez, and Psycho Loco to help tip the safe onto its back. There on the bottom of the safe was the combination, written on a dirty white label. Four turns to the right to 67. Three turns to the left to 23. Two turns to the right to 55. One turn to the left to 63. The best thing about treasure is the assortment. I didn't think gold bars really existed. I thought they were a movie prop used to speed up the plot. Yet there was a shoebox full of domino size ingots stamped Montgomery Ward 24K. Stacks of dusty paper money sat in the back, looking afraid to come out from their hiding place. Silver and platinum rings, brooches, and tiaras inlaid with rubies, emeralds, and diamonds glittered under the lamplight. It was surreal to watch Psycho Loco divide the bounty, tossing stacks of money and gold bars around the room like so many paperweights. We played the prefet is right for the jewelry. Whoever was closest to guessing the stickered price won the bauble. For a while living in Hillside was like living in the Old West in a thriving gold mining town's bubble economy. Psycho Loco customized his van. Scobie bought a car and every jazz CD on his extensive list. Joe Shenanigans, who let out a hearty Mama Mia upon receiving his share, moved to Brooklyn and tried to join the Mafia. Ms. Sanchez went door to door selling jewelry at discount prices. No M.O. Clark got plastic surgery to remove his fingerprints. His hands looked like they'd been steamrolled, sanded down, then varnished. He got a kick out of harassing the palm readers on Hollywood Boulevard. Those soothsayers who didn't pass out after looking at his glassy palms usually had the temerity to bullshit about no M.O.'s clear-headedness and his smooth future. I refused any payment for my part in the heist. I only wanted to satisfy my curiosity, not fence gold bars and pray that the money I was spending was untraceable. Psycho Loco overlooked my morality but said he would make sure I profited. He began to take a strange interest in my personal life. What did I plan to do with my future, what size family did I want, did I believe in corporal punishment for kids? When Psycho Loco asked, what would you do to instill respect for human rights throughout the world? I realized that I was filling out an application of some sort by proxy. I didn't know what I was applying for, but at the time I thought maybe Psycho Loco was entering me in a beauty pageant. I spent the last two weeks of my 16th summer away at camp, 
not shooting rapids and learning Indian folk songs but shooting baskets and learning when to double down and give weak side help. Email from Camp Dear Ma, how you? I know Christina and Nicole are a little chubby but I can't believe you couldn't tell they were pregnant until they were eight months gone. I guess when you work at a free clinic sometimes, you can't see the forest for the... Never mind, I never understood that proverb anyway. I'm sorry to hear that you all aren't getting along, but why don't they stay at the unwed mother's home rather than live with dad? Sorry for the third degree, the thought of my sisters having babies at the same time is a little unsettling. Maybe things will be better when I leave the house. I know I haven't been the ideal son. Thanks for the Nobakov, it's appropriate in this place with these bossy white men slobbering over skinny kids. Ma, I swear they look at you like they want to fuck you, using every and any excuse to slap your butt. Gooner, your shoes are laced properly. But slap. Kaufman, you ate all your lima beans. But slap. Life as the 100th best high school basketball player in America is a trip. As numero ciento I'm the last in line to do everything. Last to eat. Last to use the shower. Last to get issued the camp sweats and practice uniforms with 100 emblazoned on the back. In the college prep class, I have to sit way in the back. Not that I'm missing anything. College prep amounts to an etiquette lesson on how to behave once we get there. Don't get involved with any student groups, and uphold your professionalism and the school's honor on and off the court. Then they pass out a crib sheet with the definitions to 20 words guaranteed to be on the SAT. The best part about camp is you get to meet people from other places. I'm living in a dorm room with Khalil Ibrahim and Zane Cropsey, campers 99 and 98, respectively. Khalil is from Miami. He's always complaining that he should be rated higher than 99 but the coaches discriminate against him cause he's gay. He's right. I overheard one counselor telling a scout that the reason Khalil's court sense is so good is because his homosexualness gives him a heightened awareness of where other boys are on the court, but his presence may be detrimental to a team of normal kids. Khalil's sexuality gives him one advantage, though, no one slaps his butt. Zane is from New York City, Manhattan. Or as he says, Mahat, N. It's hard to talk to Zane because his speech consists entirely of rhetorical filler. He responds to everything with, word up, know what I'm saying, on the strength, like he's having the deepest conversations in the history of speech. Don't worry about me, ma, I'm fine. I've been deloused and the condescending white people are feeding me. Word up, on the strength. Love, your son, Gunnar. Dear Christina and Nicole, I'm sorry to hear you all and Ma aren't getting along because of the pregnancy thing, but I can't believe you'd rather live with Dad than stay at the hippo house. You know my motto, fuck that nigger. If you have boys, make sure you don't leave them alone with him. The photos of your bloated bellies are hilarious. When I told you to talk to Coach Shimamoto if you needed anything, I didn't know he'd use your stomachs for artistic canvases. The tattoos make you look like African Yakuza, and the swelling gives them a kind of 3D effect. Christina, view number 36 of the Hollywood sign from Pete's Bar at Sunset is cool. I like how Coach used your belly button as the focal point, turning it into an ashtray and going from there. Nicole, beer bottle and butterfly is absolutely amazing. It's bold yet WL foaming Fowler S. Feme faptures the transformation of inorgani F. Sophietal by Purdue F. T. into a state of synthety F. Beatitude barely distinguishable from the natural order. Did that make sense? No? Good, I'll be an art critic when I grow up. I told you Shimamoto was a good guy. Did he give you the bullshit rap that his style is derivative of the ancient Ukiyo-e school as practiced by Hokusai and Ando Hiroshigi? Don't believe it, same madness he said in art class. His stuff is a straight ripoff of the Aztec slash Diego Rivera slash lowrider murals on the freeway underpasses. 
Shimamoto been in the hood too long and don't want to admit it. Wouldn't it be funny if the ink seeped through your pores and the babies came out green and peach? Anyway, judging from his letter, it sounds like he's enjoying the Lama's classes. See you when I get back. Scobe, take care and pushush. Gunner. What's happening, Nuka? Kulin. Niggers out here have heard of you. You're an underground legend. They be asking me is it true you never miss and why don't you shoot more? The coaches are asking about you too. How tall are you? What's your quickness to speed ratio? Shit like that. As you can see, they really want to get to know you as a person. Anyway, expect to get much attention next year. I may not be around to watch, though, tomorrow I go into battle. I have to play camper number one, Leon, Housequake, Tremundo. The boy is fucking gigantic. He's 6 feet 6 inches and about 245 pounds from Washington DC. We play dominoes at night and this fool can hold 9 bones in one hand so you know, cuz, is like big as fuck. He can dunk from anywhere on the court. He got names for every one, too, the girls at St. Ignatius Swoon Boom, the buff rough motherfucker stuff, the anti-gravity levitation mid-air hesitation crazy elevation stupid escalation Geronimo look out below cold crush two hand flush. I heard during practice the kids on his team have to wear padded helmets, cause Leon Tremundo killed one of his teammates who was stupid enough to take a charging foul against him. The guy doesn't move that fast, just keeps moving. It's like he plays in slow motion, just flows up and down the court like lava. You can't stop him, he kind of just overwhelms you and you get swamped trying to guard him. If I survive, I'll let you know. His girlfriend is Missy Gibson, the actress from that sitcom Talented Tenth. You know, the show where a bunch of sedity motherfuckers be saving the community by rewarding exemplary African-American citizenship with a piece of fried chicken. By deciding to wait until marriage to have sex, Leroy and Martha are celebrating traditional African values. Here go a thigh, a wing, and a biscuit. Notice they don't never say nothing like, Lucinda decided to have a clitoridectomy. Wow, that's African have some chicken gizzards, mmm. Anyway, back to this behemoth, Leon Tremundo. Every time he dunks on a nigger, he runs into the stands to kiss Missy Gibson. Then she looks at whoever it was he served and blows that nigger a kiss. Sounds like true love. Remember the pamphlet the camp sent me with pictures of jacuzzis, the horseback riding, and shit? Well, it's all true. The place is sweet as hell. Me and this white boy from Topeka are the only ones who ride the horses. I eat lunch real fast, then run to the stables. My favorite horse is Chuckles. He's really gentle. You hop on his back and he takes off down the trail at a leisurely pace. I don't have to steer or nothing, just prod him to go faster every now and then. The horse knows each trail like ten, year olds know the alphabet. They've repeated it a million times but haven't tired of the sounds and twists and turns. I imagine Chuckles whinnies and snorts are equine for H, I, J, K, Elemenope, Q, R, S, T. I sympathize with these animals, cause this place makes me feel like a racehorse. Every morning I get up at 6 o'clock to get weighed, fed, and put through my paces. The only good thing about the place is it's fun to see the witties having to earn they propers for a change. We be disrespecting these peckerwoods something terrible. We have one play called Milkshake, which is whoever has a white kid guarding them takes that clown to hole. I'm rooming with these two fools, Touch from Miami and Z Groove from Brooklyn. They're cool, but all they do is talk about basketball, 24-7. We come back to the crib after 8 hours of playing and analyzing basketball and the first thing they do is stick a highlight reel of their hero, Cleotis Jacobin, into the VCR. We have a big screen television set in our room. Cleotis Jacobin plays for Crawdad A&M, a small division 11 school in southern Alabama.
The man can literally fly. He shoots a three-point layup where he comes flying down the court and takes off from behind the arc and swoops to the basket like he's riding a magic carpet or something. Whenever he jumps, you can hear the crowd in the background chanting, One Mississippi. Two Mississippi, until he lands. On one move he goes baseline against Tallahassee School of Cosmetology, jumps in the air, stops, hovers, then spins right, sails for a bit, then changes direction and starts floating left. I swear to God, Allah, Jehovah, Buddha, James Brown, niggers in the air so long the crowd gets to three Mississippi. It was Ham Hock night, so when he finally touched down the fans threw fatty pieces of pork and bottles of hot sauce onto the floor in appreciation. The reason Cleotus is playing in obscurity is because he cannot shoot. He has absolutely no touch. Jacobin goes to the glass like Peter Pan but finishes like a Kennedy. It's like he's playing basketball with a shot put. In one game he launched a jumper that hit the rim so hard the net fell to the floor. In another he shot the ball and it sailed through the backboard like a rock through glass. So between touch and z-groove and the adventures of Cleotus Jacobin, I'm going stir-crazy in this hole. I even brought up sex just to talk about something other than basketball. You know I rarely talk about sex. So I say, in my best macho baritone, hey, Missy Gibson got it going on just a bit, don't she? But wouldn't you know it, these guys use basketball as a metaphor for everything. Touch is like, yeah, she cute, but she don't make my starting five. Starting five? I got Lena, Methuselah, Horn at the point guard, 70 years old, running the show like a vet. Frady Washington at the two spot, dead but still full of shake and bake. My big fella in the middle is Iman, statuesque, smooth, good hands. Dorothy Dandridge at a small forward, and Lark McCarthy, the nightly news anchor, at the power spot. Halle Berry is my sixth man off the bench, instant offense. Z Groove has all dark-skinned lineup. Denzel Washington and Lightning Hopkins at the guards, the forwards Richard Roundtree and Michael Jordan, his center was Woody Strode. Cuz, I been having nightmares in this hole. Woke up last night sweating and shit, screaming, shaking. Scared the piss out of Z-Groove and touch. Z-Groove tried to play it off by saying, what you dreaming about, having a threesome with Gary Coleman and Emmanuel Lewis? Very funny, right? I didn't know what the hell I was carrying on about. All I knew was that it had something to do with death. Like I was running through different scenarios of how I'd like to die. So we got into a conversation about death or more specifically our demises, from which I concluded that niggers aren't afraid to die but are worried about how to die. We was up till five in the morning talking shit. Me, touch, how you wanna go out? 2FH, definitely on the floor dunking, bang. Raises his hands in the air simulating a dunking motion. And you know that. Word up. Have a mad large funeral. Big ass tomb and shit. Mausoleum with eternal candles, and I'd hire some out of work actors to cry at my grave 20, 4 hours a day. Z Groove, I hear you, kid. Not a bad way to die but everybody goes out dunking, word up. Me, what you mean? Z Groove, did you ever see come by FK Charleston Blue? Me, no, I read the book. Z Groove, figures. I don't know about the book, but in the movie there's this hitman, bodyguard type nigger named Stretch or some shit, and he playing ball in the park at night. He goes up to stuff this too, hander and gets machine gunned in the chest and dies hanging on the rim with his fro still perfectly combed. 2FH, that's make-believe. Any real motherfuckers die dunking? Z Groove, you ever hear of this disease called Marfan's? I did a book report on it last year. It affects tall, elongated motherfuckers. They're born with a thin aorta, and if they overexert themselves it tears and they die.
A while back Sports Illustrated did a story on Marfans, talking about this gangly-type brother who had the disease but didn't know it and died dunking in a pickup game. 2FH, what about Hank Gathers? That baller with the weak heart who died a few years back after finishing an alley-oop in front of a house full of folks. Z Groove, that's a right, only thing is I don't want white people saying I went out happy like a good b-ball playing nigger. Know what I'm saying? 2FH, what I want to know is, how come none of these overweight, hysterical coaches never bust a gut on the sideline and collapse in the middle of a big game? That shit never happened to white folks. Me, all I know is I want to die, but I don't want to die alone. Scobie, this death thing is for real. I can't avoid it so I might as well embrace it. Right? Dude, am I going crazy? Have you finished with Ella Fitzgerald yet? Later, Gunnar. P.S. I know, I know, you're saying what was my starting five? Midnight movies at shooting guard, Joan Miro at point guard, thunderstorms at small forward, the beach at power forward, and metamorphic rocks at center. Dear Psycho Loco, enclosed are the photograph and medical records you requested. Why won't you tell me what this is for? The photo is a bit mugshot-ish, but the best I can do. I've been thinking about death out here, something about being surrounded by rickety old ex-athletes trying to relive their youths. I'll talk to you more about it when I get back. Thanks for the money, Robin Hood, I hope you kept your promise not to lend me any ducats from the heist. I snuck out and went downtown to buy some books. Here are the answers to the questionnaire you sent me. Height, 6 feet 4 inches weight, 187 pounds. Favorite authors, Zora Neale Hurston, G. K. Chesterton, Richard Pryor, and Charles Chestnut favorite foods, fish tacos and grape juice greatest inventions, write on red, multiball pinball machines, and the ballpoint pen I should have the results of the sperm count by the end of the week. Incredible medical care at this mug, they got to keep they niggers physically fit. Scobie, miss ya and stay up, Gunner. Since I'm writing you this letter, it means I played against Leon Tremundo and survived. Leon didn't kiss Missy Gibson once, and after the game she refused to let him touch her. How you let that black white boy dog you? The coaches tried to offer me jersey number 8, apparently I don't penetrate enough, but I turned them down. Easy, mama, you can do something with my part of the college money, I don't think I'll need it. I was sitting in the bleachers when a white man wearing a Raleigh State shirt sat next to me. He didn't say anything but he took out his wallet and opened it so I could get a good look at what was inside, a brick of hundred-dollar bills. I thought about taking it and sending it to Christina and Nicole, but unfortunately, you raised me better than that. You're still poor ghetto child, running wild, Gunner. Dear Motom Shimamoto, I want to thank you for never screaming at me, but I'm not sure if I should. I threw the ball cross-court yesterday and this coach from Wyoming Tech, whose name I don't even know, started yelling at me. As if it were an honor for the greatest coach within spitting distance of the Grand Tetons to shout at me. The other kids put their heads down for a moment, then kept playing. I took one step up court, then beeline straight for Coach Crude. When I got over there, he tried to stare me down. I put my nose on his forehead and told him if he ever raised his voice in my direction again I'd kill him. Did I overreact? Coach, as soon as I said it, I knew I didn't mean it. So did he. But the fucker still crumpled to his knees and started pleading for forgiveness. Afraid I'd never consider attending his powerhouse program. Guess I'll never be one of those black role models who transcends race, will I? Thanks for never yelling at me, but maybe if you had I'd be used to it and wouldn't take these assholes so seriously. I think you should tell the coach over at El Campesino not to yell at me. I'd appreciate it, thanks. Can you ask Christina and Nicole not to do anything gross like saving the afterbirth in a jar? Sincerely, Gunnar. Study long, study wrong. 8.
In return for my father's not pressing charges against me and my friends for stealing the safe, I agreed to go quietly to El Campesino Real High, an elite public high school in the San Fernando Valley. It was hoped that the rain fusion of white upper-class values would decrease the likelihood of my committing another felony, but the two miserable years I spent at El Campesino had the opposite effect. If you want to raise the consciousness of an inner-city colored child, send him to an all-white high school. Five days a week I woke at 5.30 a.m. for the hour-and-a-half bus ride from our shtetl to the pristine San Fernando Valley. The migrant student workers and I trudged off the bus like a weary chain gang, fighting to stay awake and trying not to be intimidated by the luxury cars in the student parking lot, the self-assurance of everyone from the students to the cafeteria workers. I often found myself short of breath from the change in economic and cultural altitude. Gasping for air, I almost took the remedial schedule and the week's worth of lunch money my counselor, Ms. Baumgarten, offered me, but my pride got the better of me. Ms. Baumgarten, I appreciate your eleemosynary concern, but have you checked my records? My eleman, Elmo, my what? Just stop patronizing me and do your job. Treat me as an individual, not like some stray cat that you feed once a day. It had been a long time since I'd communicated with white people who weren't athletes or police officers, and here were goo-gobs of them yammering in the halls and blowing wispy bangs off their foreheads. I meshed in well. It was like swimming, you never forget how to raise your voice a couple of octaves, harden your R's, and diphthong the vowels, dewyud. Mayan. No way -ay. Whether they slouched or walked upright like proud homo erftus cutouts from the encyclopedia, these kids were so casual. Most of them never had to look over their shoulders a day in their lives until they saw us get off the bus. I was envious. When no one was looking, I found myself trying to blow puffs of air past my wrinkled brow or emulating that quivering headshake, freeing imaginary blonde locks from my eyes. It was sad to watch us troll through the halls, a conga line of burlesque self-parody, all of us affecting our white society persona of the day. Most days we morphed into waxen African Americans. Perpetually smiling scholastic lawn jockeys, repeating verbatim the prosaic commandments of domesticity, Thou shalt worship no god other than whiteness. Thou shalt not disagree with anything a white person says. When traveling in the fompany of a white person, thou shalt always maintain a respectful distant fay of two pafes to the rear. If traveling by far for Lewin F.H. at McDonald's with three or more white human deities, Thou shalt never ride in the front seat nor request to fange the radio station. Those niggers most afflicted by white supremaciosis changed their names from Raymond to Kelly or Winifred to Megan. They walked around campus shunning the uncivilized niggers and talking in bad cockney accents. Listening to teens who've been no closer to England than the Monty Python show saying, Blimey, oi I've got a blooming Edache will bring any Negro with a shred of self-respect to tears. Some situations called a not for ethnic obfuscation but for rubbing burnt cork over our already dusky features and taking the stage as the blackest niggers in captivity. We pleaded for academic leniency, Mr. Boss, sir. Is Coutance dues my homework cause welfare came and took my baby brother to the home and he had all the crayons. We performed with vaudevillian panache, like adolescent interlocutors entertaining the troops back from the Rhine. We gave goofy white kids the soul shake, caught footballs, and sang in the hallways. On weekends mom forced me to pal around with the Valley Bon Vivants. Gooner, I want you to hang out with those nice boys from school today. I bristled. Ma, make up your mind. You moved us out here. Later for those peckerwoods. What's the statute of limitations for safe cracking, seven years? That's fucked up, ma. I'd go into my, hey, guy, mode and meet my Caucasian crew in neutral areas like Venice Beach or Melrose Avenue and hang out on the strip, eating cheeseburgers and window shopping. Stay black, nigger, Scoby would call out as I boarded the bus. Scoby had a standing invitation to come along, but he always declined. 
Psycho Loco also refused, unless I agreed to set the white boys up for a robbery. And what exactly does, stay black, mean, Nick? It means be yourself, what else could it possibly mean? The arrogance of the white kids was enervating and I soon tired of their unspoken noblesse oblige, the subtle one-upsmanship. For instance, Danny Kraft was always bragging that he could name the capital of any country in the world. Test me, Gunnar, test me. Portugal? Lisbon? Poland? Warsaw? Luxembourg? Luxembourg, ha. Huh. Djibouti? What? Djibouti? Little spot near Ethiopia and Somalia. Isn't the capital Abu Dhabi? Nope. How about Kiribati? That one's Abu Dhabi. You're a dumb fuck. I thought white people were supposed to be smart. Well, ask me some real countries. What are real countries? Places where real people live? White people? What's the capital of the Maldives? Guinea? Burkina Faso? Laos? Well, motherfucker, what are the capitals? Goddamn jingoistic jerk. The most important lesson I learned at El Campesino was that I wasn't in arrears to the white race. No matter how much I felt indebted to white folks, I owed them nothing. My attitude changed. I began treating the bus ride out to the valley as a daily vacation. The school's library rivaled most college libraries and I turned it into my personal Athenaeum. I buried myself in Sanger, Celine, Baraka, Dos Passos, decompressing and reacclimating myself to myself, like a diver just returned from a deep-sea sojourn. In the library I could avoid white boys asking me if I thought blacks were closer to gorillas while tufts of unruly chest hair crept past their collars like weeds starving for sunlight. I could hide from smarmy college basketball recruiters who'd never think to look for a black athlete in the library. Ditch classes where the teachers talked past me, saying things like, it's not hard to be a millionaire. What are your parents' houses worth, $500,000? See, that's a half mil right there. I couldn't escape basketball practice. At two o'clock every afternoon Coach Logan's assistant, Mr. Wurlitz, went around to all the classes I missed and gathered my assignments. At 2.30 he kowtowed and politely asked if I would like to join the rest of the team for practice. I wasn't the basketball team's only hired gun. In hopes of dominating Valley basketball, the El Campesino Real Conquistadores brought in Anthony Price from Gardena, Anita Appleby from Torrance, and Tommy Mendoza from Echo Park. A few white players would get giddy on bus rides to games, confiding in me that playing with black players was a dream come true. Singing in the shower and jiving in the gym, what more could there be to life? Early in my senior year I sat down for my weekly career planning session with Ms. Baumgarten. This time she didn't pester me about applying to the DeVry School of Technology but looked up from her desk, shaking her head as if I'd done something wrong. I think they might have made a mistake, she said, handing me an opened envelope. My SAT scores had arrived. According to the tables, my verbal score was in the 98th percentile and my math score in the 87th. What you mean, mistake? Gunnar. You haven't been to calculus once in the past two months, and Mr. Kissio says you wrote an English lit. Composition called Machisma Hermeneutics, Hemingway and the Hacienda Gringo Lust, an obsession with the Latino male. There's no way you could get these kinds of scores. Soon letters from colleges addressed Dear Scholar, instead of What up to the best guard in the nation, began arriving. Now academic recruiters from various schools across the nation called me at home or visited me at school during lunch. The Armed Forces Academies, Harvard, and Boston University were the most aggressive pursuers. I had a good time with the stuffy admirals and majors. After giving me the standard make the world safe for democracy spiel, they'd ask what interested me. Removing a picture of Oliver North from my wallet, I'd say in a hushed tone, covert ops. 
Not your average banana republic puppet government stuff, I want to form a rebel army of Laplanders and overthrow all those neutral Scandinavian wussy socialists. I soon stopped getting letters and visits from West Point and Annapolis. The Harvard recruiter was a marginally known bespectacled public intellectual who had moved west to Los Angeles to set up a think tank of mulatto social scientists called High Yellow Fever. We had dinner at a chic Hawaiian restaurant in Marina del Rey. The regality of the Harvard man's pinkies was hypnotic. Encased in gold rings, these majestic fingers never touched any part of the PUPU platter, coolly avoided the stem of the wine glass, and punctuated his points on affirmative action with a bombastic vigor unseen since Frederick Douglass. He popped open his pocket watch and suggested we drive to his house for a nightcap. I was mesmerized, this was the first nigger I'd ever seen who owned a pocket watch and the only one I've heard say, nightcap. On the drive over I held his timepiece to my ear, listening to its spring works as if I were an 18th-century Pacific Islander hoping to trade beads for a metal cricket. The ersatz egghead lived in Cheviot Heights, in what I swore was the same house I'd stolen the security sign from a couple of years before. Over dessert he gave me a copy of his latest book, Antebellum Cerebellums, A History of Negro Super Genius, and showed me his prized collection of Peggy Lee records. After one listen to Surrey with the fringe on top, I'd pretty much decided I wasn't going to Harvard, but I didn't say anything, because the French pastry was humming. Gooner, why do you want to attend Harvard? It seems like Harvard wants me to attend Harvard. I could give a shit. Harvard, Princeton, Howard, Cornell, Fisk, I'm just determined to get out of Los Angeles. My mom keeps saying Ivy League, Ivy League, Ivy League. Look, Gunnar, I understand your reticence, but you're being offered a rare opportunity to sit in the lap of academe and suckle from the teat of wisdom. Yeah, yeah. I prefer formula milk, your shit doesn't stink as much. Sensing he was losing me, he called to his wife. Honey, come and meet this fine young man I was telling you about. A white woman in a see-through chiffon gown sashayed into the dining room like a fashion model. Baby, this is Gunnar Kaufman. The boy genius projected to do wonderful things with his life. Gunnar, this is my wife, Mindy. You may recognize her, she was the down clue girl on crosswords for cash. Glad to meet you, Gunnar. She grabbed my hand and kissed me lightly on the knuckles, then locked her hazel eyes on my crotch. You're bigger, I mean different from the other boys. No tie, no tweed jacket. Muscles. I like you. What's a four-letter word for a Russian mountain range? Ural. Smart, too. She touched the tip of my nose with her finger and skipped back to wherever she had come from, rubbing her rear end as if it pained her. Gunnar, there are fringe benefits to going to Harvard. Corporeal hors d'oeuvres, if you will. I snickered as the recruiter's sales pitch grew more desperate. I'm going to be frank with you. If I get you to attend Harvard, I get $75,000, exactly enough to buy a new motor home. Motor home? I asked. Couple of years back, some demonic rowdies from down there, he jabbed his finger angrily toward the ground, destroyed the old one. They smashed the windows, slashed the tires, urinated on the engine, set fire to the interior. We haven't gone rappelling in the Sierras since Lord knows when. I couldn't believe it was this cat's house me and Psycho Loco had rampaged the night Pumpkin died. From down where? I asked. Down there, he repeated pointing over the stone slope of the San Borracho's mountains and apparently growing agitated from having to recall the memory. Hell, you mean? No, I mean hillside. The entire community is a petri dish for criminal vermin. So I should go to Harvard and learn to become a gentrified robber baron instead? Yes, you should. I got mine, you get yours. Those poor people are beyond help, you must know that. 
The only reason I and others of my illustrious ilk pretend to help those folks is to reinforce the difference between them and us. There's a psychological advantage to being the helper and not the helpee. You know the phrase, each one, teach one. Yup. Well my motto is, each one, leech one. I stopped listening and went out by the pool. The view of Los Angeles, including Hillside, was magnificent. The web of amber streetlights looked like a constellation fallen to earth, awaiting some astronomer to connect the glowing dots to give form to its oracularity. From the sundecks of Cheviot Heights I imagined dimes falling from a stumblebum styrofoam cup as shooting stars streaking the night. I heard the nervous laughter of the seven sisters standing in doorways, deciding whether to study or hang out. I felt sorry for the night laborers on the moons, selling roses from a bucket and bags of oranges to the comets. The public intellectual excused himself and then returned with a bundle of black nylon rope and rappelling equipment. When you go to Harvard, we'll go mountain climbing on your weekends. Let me show you how. He wrapped a belt around my waist, then threaded the rope through its metal loop. Anchoring one end around the pool's stepladder, he pulled the rope tight to make sure it was secure. Hold the rope loosely with your left hand and use your right to control your speed. When you want to break, pull back. That's it, now lean back, get your butt down. There you go. I stepped over the pile of rope and tossed the coil over the fence. It tumbled down the wall until the knotted end was dangling about ten feet from the streets of Hillside. What in the hell are you doing? Now you have to recoil the goddamn thing. Ignoring his admonitions, I scaled the fence, planted my feet firmly against the wall, lowered my butt, and leaned into space. Gunnar, where do you think you're going? Home. Don't you live in the valley? Nope, I live in Hillside, the depths of hell. You're no Sir Edmund Hillary. Get back here. And you're no Lionel Trilling. Later. I lowered myself into the night. Mom was disappointed that I wasn't going to Harvard, she thought the public intellectual sounded like a decent man. There's a note on the table for you. The recruiter from Boston University stopped by the house. He came by the house. She came by the house, and she said she'll be back tomorrow. Ms. Jenkins sat at the kitchen table playing spades with me, Scoby, and Psycho Loco and fielding our questions, my mother hovering over us like a pit boss. Would you like another brew, Ms. Jenkins? I asked. Sure, I likes these carta blancas, smoother than a motherfucker. Boston doesn't have nothing like this. I fetched her another beer, making sure Scoby and Psycho Loco didn't peek at my cards. Ms. Jenkins and I were trying to set those fools. What does Boston have? Scoby asked, spinning a king of hearts across the table. Not much. No black radio. No black clubs. No black political power base. No drive through fast food. So why would I want to go there? I asked, trying to emphasize to Nick that this was my interview. You told me that you wanted to get as far out of LA as possible. That's either Orono, Maine, or Boston, Massachusetts, and I know you not no goddamn moose lover. Besides, Gunnar, I've seen your poetry in all the literary journals. I didn't make the connection until I saw the same poems scrawled on the walls in the neighborhood. You probably don't know it, but you already have a following on the East Coast. Ms. Jenkins covered Nicholas's king with a six of hearts. This our trick, nigger poet with a bourgeois following on the East Coast, Scobie crowed. Nicholas, be quiet, my mother broke in. She liked Ms. Jenkins, but she wasn't about to sell me down the river to any second-rate institution. Now you said Boston University is Ivy League, but I don't recall its being an Ivy school. Well, BU is not an original member, but we recently paid to join the Ivy League. What? said Psycho Loco incredulously, laying a three of hearts on the growing stack of cards and staring me in the eye. You can't buy your way into the Ivy League. 
You know how colleges have endowments that they invest in the stock market and futures, right? A couple of months back, the Massachusetts lottery was up to $500 million. The trustees of BU decided to buy $13 million worth of lottery tickets, figuring if they covered every possible number combination they would win at least their money back, if not more. As luck would have it, BU was the sole winner. A little hush money in the right pockets, a few well-publicized millions to each member school, and Boston University is in the Ivy League. Of course, we had to offer tuition remission to all the students with IQs under 125 we kicked out, but they'll get into other schools, if they don't snort it all away. Oh shit, I said and slapped down a five of spades. Ms. Jenkins picked up the book. Oh shit is right. So we're looking for some black students who are going to turn shit out. You down, Gooner? My mother broke in. Sounds good to me. Ma. What about me? Can I go? asked Nicholas, handing Ms. Jenkins a copy of his transcript and SAT scores. Scoby. I whined. With grades and test scores like these, Nicholas, you're a shoe in, full ride and all. What about married couples housing? Psycho loco, what you talking about? Married housing. I shouted, throwing down a jack of clubs. When you turn 18, Gooner? June 27th. Then you'll be married, nigger. Psycho Loco stood and flung down a queen of spades with such force it landed on the table with a loud pop, get up on that, Ms. Jenkins. You know a dirty bastard such as myself is cutting clubs. Ms. Jenkins laughed. Fool, you ain't said shit if an ace of spades has yet to be played, and she blanketed Psycho Loco's queen with the ace of spades, followed reluctantly by Scobie's nine of clubs. We have married housing. Gooner, you and the missus can live in one of our luxury on-campus condominiums. I'm not getting married. Gooner, I like the sound of your going back to Boston and following in the footsteps of your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather Euripides. It's as if the Kaufman legacy has come full circle. Ma. So it's settled, Gooner's going to be you, Mr. Loco, why don't you attend Boston U? I'm sure I could get you admitted under the auspices of our unique quality life experience program. Nah, I don't think college is for me. I'd get in there and have to shoot the entire history department. What you mean, remember the Alamo? Blam. 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 That be some multiculturalism for yo, ass. I'm not getting married. With my immediate future assured, I stopped going to class and steadily began to lose interest in playing basketball. During games, when I wasn't playing I sat on the bench reading. Coach Logan threatened to fail me if I didn't commit myself to basketball. Psycho Loco suggested I take the GED and forget school, which I did. I decided my last day of school at El Campesino would be the playoff game at Phyllis Wheatley. The papers tried to create a civil war atmosphere by depicting Nicholas and me as best friends fighting on enemy sides. There were ugly undertones to the whole affair. The headlines read, Kaufman seeks to demystify b-ball prestidigitator. By now coach Shimamoto had convinced Scobie not to be ashamed of his talents and to play hard, not to please others but to please himself. In the past two years Scobie had scored over a thousand straight baskets, and a local media usually clamoring for perfection from its athletes couldn't accept the perfect athlete. Instead of appreciating Nicholas's gift, they treated Scobie as an evil spirit, an idiot savant with a bone through his nose who made the basketball sail through the hoop by invoking African gods. Scobie denied that he was a demigod and told his falling out of the tree story, but the rumors persisted. One report had him drinking chicken blood and kissing shrunken heads before games. Another had him commiserating with a witch doctor and practicing in a grass skirt. In a failed attempt to inject some humor into the situation, 
Coach Shimamoto told the news services that during a trip to Africa he had found Nicholas throwing coconuts into a hollowed-out tree trunk from 75 feet away and that at age 4 Nicholas could thread a needle in one try every time. I was portrayed as the golden child, white society's mercenary come to teach the pagans a lesson. Starting at guard for El Campesino Real Conquistadores, Hernán Cortés Kaufman. On the morning of the big game, the El Campesino cheerleaders rousted all the white players out of bed for a unity breakfast at a diner in the valley. They called me from the restaurant to say they wished I could be there eating pancakes with the rest of the team but I lived so far away. While the witties pep rallied over banana pancakes, I planned my first rebellious act. During the pre-game shoot-around, I walked over to the scorer's table and made some changes to the starting lineup sheet. The horns sounded to signal the start of the game, and as the team huddled around Coach Logan for instructions I stood on the outskirts, slipped on a pair of white gloves, smeared my lips with cold cream, and hid my head under my warm-up jacket. The crowd quieted as they announced the starting lineups. And now the visiting El Campesino Real Conquistadores. At center, Lawrence O'Shaughnessy. Larry, the lone white starter, ran out to center court, nervously clapping his hands and jumping up and down waiting to greet the rest of the starting team. At a forward, Anthony Rastus Price. A few people in the crowd laughed as Anthony jogged to his spot with a quizzical look on his face. The announcer continued, at the other forward, Anita, Aunt Jemima, Appleby. At guard, Tommy, Nigger, T. Mendoza. Anita and Tommy peeled off and ran to their stations, red-faced but chortling with the crowd. The laughter died down as the fans strained to hear what the announcer would say next. The band went into an extended drumroll as I sat alone on the bench, my head down and hands folded under my armpits. At guard, First Team All-City, Second Team All-American, Hillside's own Gooner, Hambone, Hambone, have you heard, Kaufman. I lurched from the sideline, shuffling through the gauntlet of astonished teammates as slowly as I could, my big feet flopping in front of me, my back bent into a drooping question mark. My gloved hands slid along the floor, trailing behind like minstrel landing gear. The gymnasium erupted. People rolled in the aisles with laughter, light bulbs popped. I don't suppose they could hear me whistling, the old gray mare, through the powdered donut that was my slack-jawed mouth. I stood at center court and gave a hearty, howdy, y'all. Coach Logan tried to get me replaced, but it was too late. The scorebook listed me as a starter, and the referees could find nothing in the rulebook about playing with white shit on your face, and I successfully argued that if you could play in a wrist brace, you could play in cotton gloves. Larry won the opening tip-off and out of force of habit passed the ball to me. I streaked past everyone and threw down a thunderous slam dunk. Someone called a timeout and Coach Logan substituted for me. I shuffled off the court in a somnambulant gait and headed straight to the locker room to cheers of Gooner. Gooner. When I returned, fresh-faced and dressed in street clothes, Logan ordered me to sit and shut my monkey ass up. Oblivious to his ranting, I threw my uniform in a pile at his feet, set it afire, and sat next to coach Shimamoto for the rest of game, which Wheatley won by 60 points. My mother didn't seem too displeased, she and Psycho Loco were in the stands making summer wedding plans.